Well, welcome to another End Times Berean video. My name is Christian Widener, and I want to take you with me to wade into a question that has some surprisingly fierce debate surrounding it. And along the way, we're going to discover when Jesus was born, when he died, when he started his ministry, and how long his ministry really lasted. And then, because I seem to love controversy, we're also going to talk about Sunday worship, listening to a pastor, and tithing, uh, whether those are really true early church traditions or not. And I'm also going to take a risk of talking about what it means to keep the Sabbath for the church. So I really hope you'll hang in there with me for the whole video, because I promise I will stun you at least once along the way. And uh, But the first question is that we're going to really deal with is, when exactly was Jesus crucified? And why does it matter? Because that answer has a, a surprising connection with the timing of Christ's return. And so now a lot of people who've studied this or know about it, I'm pretty sure that I'm going to present some things that like, whoa, I don't know about that. Are you willing to have some assumptions challenged? And so if your mind is already made up, then and you don't want to be confused with the facts, then you, you might start tuning out at some point. But I really hope you don't, because uh, this is an evidence-based approach, and sometimes it's like working on a Rubik's Cube puzzle. Just because you can't solve it right away doesn't mean there's no solution. And when you do find the solution, it should be obvious to others as well. And, you know, not only that, but all six sides need to be solved. And a lot of times, you know, oh, someone will present a partial solution that looks like it's solved, but really it's not. So, you know, there's some nuance there. But, but when you show a completed true solution, I think it is obvious. And, you know, I'm an engineer. Uh, someone might wonder, well, why should we listen to you over all these other guys that are out there? And what I try to do in when I present information and I present a solution is to show you the solution, show you how it works, to turn the, the cube, you know, to show you all six sides. And I think that's really the best way to establish truth in this day that is really ripe with deception. But all of this work is not just for academic purposes. It's because it's about the end of the world. That's if you're watching the end times Brian channel, it's because it's about the end times. And if you haven't seen my other videos, I hope you will check them out, because I've got quite a few talking about why this is really the last days and what things in prophecy have been, look to me at least, to be have been fulfilled and look like they're continuing on the pattern of the tribulation and the days that we were told to watch for by Jesus. And it starts with the decree everyone missed, the tribulation signs that we've been seeing, the abomination of desolation, the beast rising to power, the last jubilee. I, I really hope you check out all those out. Okay, but some people, if you've been watching me for a while, you might be wondering, is 2027 really still viable? I mean, look, the world's not on fire yet. We're almost five years into this. So maybe 2028, 2034, those kind of, you know, maybe we're looking further out. It's not really coming that fast. Now, many, though, do recognize that Christ's return is very close. And there have been some compelling cases presented for the final seven years to start in 2023 or 2024, or speculating that it might still start in 2025 to 2027. And, and those kind of would, again, push out to dates 2028 to 2034, which is later than what I'm, what I'm supposing it might be. But most of these cases that have been made depend on, ironically, the year of Christ's crucifixion. And in in turn, that depends on what day of the week one believes that Jesus was crucified. And so it seems like a trivial matter, and yet it, it really has a lot to do with, with end times eschatology. So it seems trivial. You know, why does it matter whether Jesus was crucified on a Wednesday or Thursday or Friday or, or some any other day, actually? And how does that, you know, understanding affect the year that we, we think Jesus was crucified? And how does that... In, turn, if it changes the year, how does that affect the year that we think Jesus could return? And so there is this surprising connection between the cross and the return of Christ and the apocalypse. And so depending on whether you see a Wednesday to Friday, 28 to 34 AD crucifixion, or as I'm saying, 27 AD, or should it be maybe later, 28 to 2034? So how does this really, are there any facts that we can really know? And this is what I want to explore in this video. And because all of these, these things, determining the day and the year, they depend on three main things. One, you know, most people are trying to uh, satisfy the words of Scripture. They believe that Scripture is true. They believe it's the inspired, inspired Word of God, and therefore they want to 
you know, show that everything that's written is true. But it's how we understand that to be fulfilled is is where some of the subtlety comes in. And then we're people are going to mostly reference historical testimonies and other evidence as also parts of maybe potentially making their case. And then knowing the day of the week of the Passover in the years from 28 to 34 AD is another one of those, like if there wasn't a Passover on a Friday, then it's hard to say that Jesus was crucified in that year if we think he was crucified on Friday. So, and then the other things that are part of this is we know Jesus rose on the third day and on the first day of the week, which was Sunday. So first, let's just look at how do we know Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday, the first day of the week. And one of the best verses for this is Mark 16, 9. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. Now, when it says when Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, that's a very explicit statement that he rose on the first day of the week. But we have other verses, like after the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. That was Matthew 28, 1. Or very early in the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, Mark 16, 2. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb, Luke 24, 1. And finally, in John 21, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. Now, some people may look at this and go, wait, but when did they leave? Was it while it was still dark, just very early in the morning, at dawn, just after sunrise? Which is it? Some people have wondered, like, yes, but look at these different timings. You know, they're kind of contradicting each other, aren't they? And and actually, no, I think it it's a good example of how multiple testimonies will pull out different facts, and and they won't be, if they're not copied from each other, they'll actually present a little bit different information, but if you understand them correctly, they're not really contradictory. For example, you know, they went at dawn, but they went while it was still dark. They went very early in the morning, and they arrived at the tomb just after sunrise. You know, it's a walk. They had to get to the tomb, so there's no real contradiction here. Now, then the next question is, was it really Sunday? And because it says the first day of the week, the Greek words that are translated there are heis ho sabaton. And so English translations almost unanimously, you know, more than 96% of the English translations will just call this for the first day of the week. And, and that's, you know, Sunday. But there are two translations, the Jubilee Bible and Young's literal translation that call it the first of the Sabbaths. So this is one of the first... You know, if you're familiar with, if you've heard this argument, you might then be going, well, yeah, doesn't that say it's it's on a Sabbath, uh, because it's Sabaton, and which is really the correct translation? And so, actually, both are technically correct. And you're like, huh? All right, and, and if you've heard me before, I like to, to point this out. A lot of times, people are arguing of one or the other, and it's both. Sabaton does mean both the Sabbath, and it means a week, it means a full seven days. So this expression does mean day one, or the first of the week, and so that's commonly understood as the first day of the week, and then it also could be taken to mean the first of the Sabbaths for the counting of the Omer for Pentecost, and that's Leviticus 23, 15, you shall also count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, which is of Passover, from the day when you brought in the sheaf of the wave offering, there shall be seven complete Sabbaths. So the first Sunday after Passover was the beginning of the Omer count, and it was the first of seven Sabbaths. So I've got a chart here for you to, to, to look at to understand this. But only if Jesus was raised on Sunday after Passover could it have also been the first week of the Omer, in other words, the first of the Sabbaths. So that first Sunday after Passover is the beginning of the count for the Omer, and that's always on a Sunday, and that's your first Sabbath week, okay? And then if you look and you know pay attention, here's a bonus. The 50th day is always, which is Pentecost, and which the Jews called Shavuot, or the Feast of Weeks, is always Sunday, So, which was the day the church was born by the Holy Spirit. And so that is something that's kind of amazing. The church was born on a Sunday on Pentecost, and Pentecost literally is always a Sunday because of the way the, the Torah you know, told them to count the Omer. And this is confirmed by Clement of Alexandria in about 200 AD, which is just an early church father, you know, writing about this. The resurrection was on Sunday, the first day of the week. 
and he wrote, He certainly rose on the third day, which fell on the first day of the week of harvest, on which the law prescribed that the priest would offer up the sheaf. So this is showing that he fulfilled the first fruits. That's also the first fruits uh, festival. And so it was the feast of first fruits, the day after Sabbath. And and that's uh, from Leviticus 23, 11. He is to wave the sheaf before the Lord, so it will be accepted on your behalf. The priest is to wave it on the day after the Sabbath. Okay? So this is just whether Jesus was, you know, raised on the, whether you understand that phrase you know, on the first day to be on the first day of the week, which is obviously Sunday, or on the first of the Sabbaths, of the one of the Sabbaths, it still had to be Sunday. It had to be uh, the first um, of the the Feast of first fruits, and it also had to be then the same day, 50 days later, that the church was actually born, which is kind of interesting. Now then the next question is about on the third day, so 10 times in Scripture, it says, on the third day, Jesus was raised. And that's in Matthew 16, 21, and they're all there. But here's some of them. They will kill him, and on the third day, he will be raised to life. That's Matthew 17, 23. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day, be raised again. That's Luke 24, 7. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. That's Acts 10, 40. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, 4, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. So this is really important. Scripture is saying ten times it was on the third day. But there is one reference. There's a single statement in scripture by Matthew, which appears to be contradictory, and that people have built an alternate case for understanding Jesus' day day of crucifixion, and it's Matthew 12, 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish... So the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So what do you mean, three days and three nights? So one of the chief conundrums of the crucifixion is understanding how Jesus could be resurrected on the third day, but also spend three days and three nights in the tomb. Now why? Because on the third day is less time than three complete days and nights, which would place the resurrection then on the fourth day. So how can it be both? How can it be three days which is Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Okay, that's no problem. But three nights would be, for example, Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday night, which then would put the resurrection on Sunday. That's, you know, a fourth day. So that seems like a problem. And some even say that Jesus was actually crucified on a Wednesday, and Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, and that he was resurrected at sunset on Saturday, and then he, you know, would have been in the tomb then and not discovered until Sunday. But that seems kind of like a, a tough fit because Mark 16, 9, when Jesus rose early on the first day of the week. So, so that would seem to, to count that out. And I actually used to hold a Thursday view myself because that seemed like that was the best way to get three nights. But I was challenged to dig deeper on that question. I found really Friday is the only option, and, and that's what I'm going to be talking about with you and why, but the scriptures can't be broken, so there has to be a solution, okay? And there is a solution. The Bible says darkness came over the land from noon until three in the afternoon when Jesus died. That's in Mark uh, chapter 15. And there was a Greek historian, Phlegon, who recorded that there was an eclipse in 33 AD when even the stars became visible. And Jesus, so he died during a supernatural evening. You know, obviously a natural eclipse you know, can't last three hours. So we know this was a supernatural event, but it was recorded like it was an eclipse. When you, if you've ever been in in a total eclipse, it does really become like night and stars will become visible. And in Genesis 1, each day actually begins with the evening, not the morning. There was evening and there was morning and, you know, it was the first day. Also, Jewish tradition considers it night when even just three stars appear in the sky. You can find that in the Mishnah Torah Sabbath 5-4, just to show that, oh, that really is, you know, their their tradition. And so how can we see the solution then for three days and three nights? Evening one, Friday, is a supernatural darkness when Jesus dies, and he dies at the end of the three-hour darkness. And then after that, it becomes light, and the remainder of that day on Friday, while they're preparing him to get him to the tomb, that becomes his first day. So it was evening, and then it was morning, and that was the first day, so that's all on Friday. 
Then evening two is Friday night, which is really the beginning of Saturday in the Jewish reckoning and the beginning of the Passover. And Saturday day is the rest of Passover, and that becomes the second day. That's the full Passover. And then Saturday night is really the first night of Sunday, and that's the end of the rest. And actually after that, it's dark, but you know the, the town comes alive, and, and people can still do things. And the women went, and they could get the supplies that they needed. And then day three, Sunday morning, which is pre-dawn, first light, you know, it starts to become light even before the sun comes up. The soldiers are terrified and flee. The women, you know, leave their homes at that time. They arrive at the tomb just after sunrise. Okay, so, so that would actually give you three days and three nights and on the third day. But we have to recognize the supernatural darkness when Jesus died. Okay, but there's an objection that could be made to that, that Jesus wasn't in the ground when he died, um, when he was on the cross during the darkness. Okay, that he was in the heart of the earth, but that means he should be buried and he wasn't buried yet. But the answer is really simple, that Jesus' spirit descended into the depths of the earth spiritually when he died. So, you know, he made the proclamation of those in chains. We see that in Ephesians 4.9 and 1 Peter 3.19. You know, also, what is he—he he ascended, mean, except that he also descended into the depths of the earth, in which he also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. And so this is about him going down into the earth, and then to show that in Hebrew thought, the the dead spirits were also, you know, in the earth. Here's Ezekiel 32, 24. Alam is there with all her hordes around her grave, all of them struck down by the sword. They went down uncircumcised to the lower parts of the earth. Those who spread terror in the land of the living, now they will bear, bear their shame with those who descend to the pit. So, you know, hell, the, the, the place where spirits are kept in chains is thought to be deep in the earth, and so there's no, you know, conflict with that you know, that the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth, just like uh, Jonah was three night, three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, because that's, as soon as he died, that's where his spirit went um, in judgment. Now, it couldn't hold him there, but, but he did descend there, as, as, we, as we read in the Scriptures. Now, another objection that has been made is that it has to be a full 72 hours, and Friday from 3 p.m. to, um, you know, 4 to 6 a.m. Sunday isn't a full 72 hours. But Scripture doesn't say 72 hours, right? So insisting on it is attempting to add to Scripture. Plus, in Jewish thought, any part of the day is as the whole. That's also in, in the Mishnah. And it just, it's also actually generally true in Western thought. So, for example, if someone says, I'll be back in two days— we don't assume 48 hours. We generally will understand that means they're going to return the day after tomorrow, regardless of the time of day the statement's made or the time of day when they return. Okay, so it, it doesn't at all need to be 72 hours. Uh, there's also some objections that say, well, but the women needed an extra day to go buy supplies. And that seems, you know, like a good idea, but it's it's wrong. Um, and, and, and why? Because if you've been to Israel and you're there on the Sabbath in Jerusalem, everything closes down during the Sabbath, but as soon as the sun sets and it becomes night, the whole town comes alive. So the women could have gone to the home of those who sold spices, and they often sold them you know, right out of their home or very close to their home was their shop so that they could you know, keep an eye on it. They were their own security guards, for example. So it wasn't hard to know where the people lived who sold spices and to show up there after sunset on Saturday and buy what you needed, and they could have worked by lamplight all night if they needed to, to be ready by dawn. So there's another objection that says, well, but a high Sabbath, this was a high Sabbath, and that's different from a regular Sabbath. And that's true, but it's not really true. So let, let's look at the scripture in John 19, 31, is where this comes from. Then the Jews, because it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, they asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might, that they might be taken away. Okay, but that expression really means it's just the Sabbath of a festival. It's, it was the Sabbath of Passover. That's what made it a high Sabbath. And you could have a Sabbath for a festival that wasn't on a Sabbath, but, but it doesn't matter whether it was a real, like a seventh, you know, Saturday day or not. If it was a Sabbath associated with a festival, it was called a high Sabbath. There wasn't a difference between the Sabbath of a festival, whether it was actually on Saturday or not. And so um, also the, 
day of preparation refers to the, the Jews stopping work so they could get ready for the Passover, but it wasn't like a prohibition against working on that day. All right. Then there's another objection someone might raise about the Last Supper, and really it's this is how could Jesus properly have had the Passover before everyone else did on the 15th of Nisan? Okay, and this is really awesome. This is kind of a... I, I, I hope, you know, think about this. Um, so because the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed between the evenings of Nisan 14, so Exodus 12, 6 says, Be'in ha'arabin, which is normally translated at twilight, but harabim is the evening plural. So this is literally between the evenings, the, the lamb has to be killed. So that, that's really a 24-hour period. And it would, must also be eaten on the same night it's killed. And that comes from Exodus 12, 8. They shall eat the flesh that same night, roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Whenever they kill it, they have to eat it the same night. So if they killed the lamb Thursday night, which was the start of Nisan 14, then they had to eat it Thursday night. And if they killed the lamb Friday afternoon when everybody else did, that's still Nisan 14, then they had to eat it Friday night, which would have been Nisan 15. Okay, makes sense. So here's a timeline that tries to show this for Nisan 14. So first of all, Jesus and his disciples didn't have the Last Supper meal until it was evening. And we see that in the scriptures, Matthew 26, 20. Now when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the 12 disciples. So they didn't go have the dinner until it was night, right? So the Last Supper lamb... Jesus, the Lamb of God, and all the Jewish Passover lambs were all killed on Nisan 14 between the evenings. I mean, that's just amazing. So if you look at this timeline, that's the start of Thursday night. So the sun goes down, it becomes night. They have time to kill the lamb and prepare the dinner. And then after they've prepared the dinner, they can start the supper. And then Judas betrays Jesus and he leaves. And then they finish supper and they go to the Mount of Olives to pray. And then Jesus is arrested and then he's tried before the Sanhedrin during the night, and then Jesus is tried probably early in the morning before Pilate, and then he's crucified uh, still in the morning, and then there's darkness over the land from 12 until 3 when he dies, and then he's quickly prepared for burial and put in the tomb before sunset. And you see that Jesus' Passover lamb, all of the uh, the lambs that that were were being uh, killed for Passover, were being killed while Jesus was being crucified, and then Jesus himself died. I mean, it's just, it's amazing that all of these Passover lambs all fit into Nisan 14, and only if God made the instruction that it had to be between the evenings, and that it had to be the same night that the lamb was killed, could you actually fulfill the Passover on two different nights like this, and, and in these two different ways, and fulfill all the words of Scripture. I mean, it's just, it's phenomenal, it's super exciting when you really think about this and see how, you know, wise and how foresighted God really was, As even as he's making the commandment. He knows exactly how he's going to fulfill it, you know, um, you know, 1,500 years later in, in his son. So the other thing that's really important about this question of when was Jesus crucified is that church history is really unanimous. I mean, every tradition is that, you know, uh, there was a Friday crucifixion and a Sunday resurrection. And this is true in the early church fathers' writings. It's true of the Armenian church, the Assyrian church, the Coptic church, the Catholic church, the Greek and Oriental Orthodox traditions, that there isn't a non-Friday tradition. And you, you think, you know, surely there must be some historic alternative to that, and there really isn't any credible sources that are other than a Friday and a Sunday uh, crucifixion time. Now, some claim if you, you know, here's an article, you know, centuries old documents show evidence for a Wednesday crucifixion. But if you dig into this, it comes from the Didascalia Apostolorum, which is a work of the third to fourth centuries, so a long time after uh, Christ's resurrection, of course. And they say it supports a Wednesday crucifixion because it says Jesus was arrested on a Wednesday. But then that very same text goes on to say Jesus was crucified on Friday. So, you know, it doesn't at all present a different tradition. It has, I think, what's a mistake on saying that Jesus was arrested on Wednesday, but it's still, you know, confirms that Jesus was crucified on Friday. 
And then in the 5th century, there's a church historian named Socrates who reported that some Christians celebrated Easter on Saturday. Okay, and then people proposed that, oh, that means Jesus. there's a different tradition about Jesus' death and resurrection. But even that kind of report, all that tells you is that they had that practice. It doesn't tell you any of the beliefs or the reasons behind that practice. And a much more likely scenario is that that was some people choosing to worship on Saturdays and then therefore choosing to celebrate Easter also on the day that they worship, which would keep it on Saturday. But, you know, th there's very few and, and sp not spurious, but just, you know, there's no evidence that there's a credible sort of ch early church tradition to support that. So furthermore, the sources that we do have are very emphatic that the church met on Sunday, um, it begins in Scripture, you know, that tells the early church testimony that the first day of the week was when they met together, and you see this in uh, Acts 20, verse 7, on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. So this is sort of the first scriptural, you like, oh, they're meeting on Sunday. And then tithing was also established and collected weekly, even in the early church, because 1 Corinthians 16, 2 says, On the first day of the week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. And you see, he's, he's calling for it every week on the first day of the week. That's, you know, that's a, like a regular tithe. And then if you want to look at some of the writings of the early church fathers, so Justin Martyr, who's, who's really writing you know, maybe 60 years after the death of John the Apostle. He wrote, Sunday is the day on which we all hold our common assembly, because it is the first day in which God, having wrought a change in the darkness and matter, made the world, and Jesus Christ our Savior on the same day rose from the dead. For he was crucified on the day before that of Saturday, of Saturn, uh, which is Saturday, and on the day after that of Saturn, which is the day of the sun, having appeared to his apostles and disciples, he taught them these things, which we have submitted to you for your consideration. And so we see right from Justin Martyr that they were meeting on the Sunday. He affirms that that's what everybody does, and that Jesus was crucified on Friday and, and rose on Sunday. And then if you want to see the first example of worship with a pastor— in the early church, which is, I know, another controversial issue, Justin Martyr also wrote, And on the day called Sunday, all who live in cities or in the country gather together in one place, and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read, as long as time permits, and then the reader, when the reader has ceased, the pastor, which is the Greek word proestimi, it's also sometimes translated president or leader, but the pastor verbally instructs and exhorts to the, lim to the imitation of these good things. And then we all rise together and pray, and as we before said, when our prayer is ended, bread and wine and water are brought, and the pastor in like manner offers prayers and thanksgivings according to his ability, and the people assent, saying amen. So you see them keeping communion, meeting together on Sundays. This is very much like what we still do today. Now, do you have to meet on Sunday? I mean, of course not. So meet on Saturday or Friday or Wednesday or every day, uh, you know, read Romans 14, 4 to 6. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord. So, you know, yes, we can worship on any other day too, right? That's not really the issue that I'm trying to make here. So I'm not bringing this up to bring judgment, but do not doubt that historically Sunday was the day of the crucifixion, or that from the earliest days it was established by the apostles and the early church as the day for Christians to assemble. Now there's also a little caveat, early Jewish Christians would still go to temple and synagogue, and that's because they were witnessing and ministering and you know, trying to reach their Jewish brethren, and so they, they actually did both, Saturday and Sunday. And you know that's just you know that's just what it what it was. It, it's we see it in in even in the early church. They went to the temple and the synagogue, and they reasoned with their brethren. But also they were meeting together on Sunday. So, 
How does this, though, all come together? The day of the crucifixion actually determines the year of the crucifixion. And so that's, you know, that, that's an important point to understand. So if you look at the years between 28 and 34 AD, the days that we know were Passovers, it was Tuesday, March 30th, and 28 AD. It was a Monday, April 18th, and 29 AD. It was a Friday, April 7th, and 30 AD. So you can kind of look through and see what were possible days for the crucifixion. And so there's really only two dates in that list, though, that could have been a Friday crucifixion, and that's 30 and 33 AD. So any other day of the week would push the crucifixion to a different year, and even then you could only have the crucifixion in one of those days, and even Wednesday, I think, is pushing it. You really only have those two possible days, I would say, that that are a reasonable date for the crucifixion. And the early church fathers, again, affirmed this, and they affirmed also that it was marked by an eclipse. So Tertullian, around you know the 200s, early 200s, wrote, In the same hour, too, the light of day was withdrawn, when the sun at the very time was in its meridian blaze, and those who were not aware that this had been predicted about Christ no doubt thought it an eclipse. You yourselves have the account of the world portent still in your archives. So Tertullian is saying, this is still in your archives. You know this happened. Right? This is an undeniable um, fact that it's recorded, and it was recorded in Roman records that there was an earthquake and an eclipse in the fourth year of the 202nd Olympiad. And, and this is in Phlegon, who wrote in about a the Greek historian in 137 AD, in the fourth year, however, of Olympiad 202, which is 33 AD, an eclipse of the sun happened, greater and more excellent than any that had happened before it. And this is how we know it was supernatural, right? This wasn't just like any normal eclipse. At the sixth hour, day turned into night, so the stars were seen in the sky, and an earthquake in Bithynia toppled many buildings of the city of Nicaea. So we know that there was an earthquake. We know that it turned dark. We know even that the stars became visible, which would have qualified it as an evening in Jewish thought. And the early church father Hippolytus who wrote another century after that, again affirmed this same thing as being true. This was 33 AD. This is how we know, you know that Jesus really died in that time, and it was one of the, the secular proofs that they used to evangelize people in, in their day. There's also evidence of an earthquake in Judea in 33 AD that, that goes along with and confirms these early reports that we have from this Greek historian and we read in Matthew 27, 54, also that there was an earthquake, because it says, When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. So we know there was an earthquake, and people have gone and looked in to find it in the geologic record, and the Christquake is a movie on YouTube. You can watch this. I, I recommend it. It's The information is here. You can just search for this and find it. But it talks about there's really very few earthquakes in this time period. There's one like in 33 BC, and, and or 37 BC, and then in 33 AD, so almost, you know, 70 years later, there was another earthquake. And so these are really separated and very distinguishable and unique in the geologic record. And we see it at that the uh, earthquake recorded by the Romans is found actually in the geology today. You can see it. So that makes a really tight lock on was 33 AD the, the right year or not. And so if early church testimony and Roman records are so strong for 33 AD, then why are any other dates for the crucifixion even considered? And it comes down to this, because of the need to resolve the apparent discrepancies in Scripture, which we talked about, you know, how can it be three days and, and three nights and on the third day? So, you know, people not believing that Friday could meet and fulfill the Scriptures. So where the other reason is that people believe that tradition says that Jesus' ministry was only about three and a half years long. And so, which if Jesus began his ministry in 27 AD, then it would force a 30 AD or even earlier crucifixion. And so, you know, when was Jesus' ministry? When did it really start? Was it in 27 AD, or maybe it was in 29 AD? Maybe it was a little bit later to push it to 33. So people kind of are, are forced to look at one of these two dates, 33 AD or 27 AD, and kind of choose between them. And that's because in Luke chapter 3, it tells us that John the Baptist began his ministry in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. 
which would be 26 AD. And, you know, the, the idea is the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar must in, be including his two-year co-regency. For two years, he was Tiberius Caesar, and he was co-regent. After the two years, he became the sole uh, emperor, and so his name became, and he received a new title, his title became Tiberius Caesar Augustus. And Tiberius Caesar was made co-regent in 12 AD, so his first year was from 12 AD to 13 AD, and thus his 15th year was from 26 to 27 AD. And so if it was the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar Augustus, it would, it would be starting only when he became Caesar Augustus. If it says the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, then we should understand that he's starting the count as soon as he became co-regent, which co-regent is still full regent. It's not like he's less than a regent, it's just they're sharing power. We also know that John the Baptist was uh, six months older than Jesus from Luke 1, 26. And then we also know that Jesus was 30 when he began his ministry, and that's in the first part of Luke 3, 23. Now, Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. And we also know that Jesus was born before Herod the Great died. So when did Herod the Great die? No, I mean, these these are lots of, these are tough, you know, because everything's connected, and I hope I'm not losing you. But they're trying to keep, everybody wants to keep all the facts straight. And, and that can be a little difficult, but if we, if we keep in mind that Jesus obviously had to have been born before Herod the Great died, who was the one who the Magi visited, and who tried to kill Jesus when he killed all the babies in Bethlehem. So, so putting that together is important. And there are many reports and pieces of information that have to be all reconciled together to understand when Jesus was born. And picking and choosing which dates you know one prefers allows people to kind of come up with the idea that Jesus could have been born anywhere between 6 BC and 1 BC and some maybe even would say later than that but first Jesus had to be born before Herod the Great died which scholars variably date between 1 and 4 BC okay but but there is an actual simple answer for this it's that Josephus says that Herod reigned 37 years and he was appointed in the 184th Olympiad under the consulship of Gaius Asinius Polio. And this is a really important fact, because Roman records show that Gaius Asinius Polio only served one year, and the only time that Gaius Asinius Polio was in office in the 184th Olympiad was 40 BC, the very first year, because after that he was removed. So in order for that to be true, then Herod the Great had to have died in 3 BC, or possibly very late in 4 BC. And then we also know that uh, his son Philip became Tetrarch, and he reigned until 34 AD, and he also reigned for 37 years, and he, it says that he died in the 20th year of Tiberius Caesar Augustus. And so this is another thing now. Now we know we're counting 20 years, but not from the beginning of Tiberius Caesar's co-regency, but from the time that he was Augustus, and you put all that together, which would give us then uh, that he reigned until 34 AD and began in 3 BC, which gives you the uh, 37 years with a partial year. There's one additional point that's worth at least mentioning. Josephus reported that Herod died after an eclipse and before Passover. There were only two eclipses that could be in view, March 13th and 4 BC, which was 29 days before Passover, and January 10th, 1 BC, which was 86 days before Passover in, that, in, that, in those same years. That causes many to conclude that either Herod died in 4 BC or in 1 BC, and they want to tie it directly to an eclipse in that year. But allowing for Herod's death in late 4 BC or early 3 BC would allow 6 to 11 months after an eclipse and then three to eight months before Passover in 3 BC, which reasonably allows for all the events recorded by Josephus that took place in between to occur. And so the argument really against March 13th, 4 BC, is that it wasn't enough time before the Passover, and so that forces an argument to January 10th. But all you have to do is see the eclipse in 4 BC, the Passover and, and death in 3 BC, and the problem is solved. Okay, so... The evidence then altogether converges on 27 AD, because if Herod died in 3 BC, then Jesus would have been born approximately one to two years before that, because Herod killed all the babies that were two and under in Bethlehem. And Herod likely killed the babies that were a little older than Jesus, 
you know, what they suspected his age was, but also Jesus lived in Egypt for a little while before Herod died, so for sure Jesus couldn't have been born earlier than, than 4 BC. But also, if John the Baptist started his ministry in 26 AD, the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, then Jesus could not have been more than 30 at that time, and therefore he couldn't have been born earlier than 5 BC, because Jesus and John are basically the same age, and if Jesus starts in, in 27 AD, then he can be born in, you know, he has to be born 30 years before that, and if you, if you try to make 6 or 7 BC, then Jesus is starting his ministry too old. He's starting his ministry even before John the Baptist started his ministry, and, and that, that's not right. So altogether, Jesus was most likely born between the late 5 BC Christmas, which is actually uh, a tradition that goes all the way back to at least Hippolytus in the 3rd century, or maybe possibly in the spring of 4 BC. But there's a pretty narrow window. Somewhere between the end of 5 BC and early 4 BC was, would have been the, the birth time of Jesus. But then what about the Star of Bethlehem? And if you've seen some of these... Uh, looks at the stars and then trying to go back and equate that to the time of Jesus' birth, the main event people reference is a conjunction of Jupiter and Venus that occurred on June 17th, 2 BC. And so first, celestial events, I think, normally announce or confirm the general time of something, not the specific day of an event. And second, that date is, is too late to have been associated directly with Jesus' birth, based on all the other things we just talked about. And there's a guy, Jason Lyle, at the Biblical Science Institute. He's written a great article on this, so I, won't, I don't need to say any more than that, but I'll point you to his article if you'd like to look at, at kind of an assessment of the Star of Bethlehem. But there's also reports that there was a Revelation 12 sign that could have potentially been a prophetic revelation of Jesus' birth and maybe even you know marking the exact day. And the late Michael Heiser also supported this view, but it's just, it's one, it's too late to have announced Jesus' birth for the same reasons earlier, but it could have been a general sign after Jesus was born, or it may even have indicated the time that Jesus was being called out of Egypt, and which is Hosea 11.1, 1, out of Egypt I called my son. I mean, it is an interesting sign, but I don't think we can say, oh, we know that Jesus was born and this sign had to be present. I, I just, that's not the way we've seen some signs. The signs that we've been seeing even lately have been generally associated with the times, but not like the exact day. It's more like a billboard than like a, a mile marker. So if we know, though, that 27 AD must have been the start, and we know 33 AD was the end, that creates an interesting question then, because it looks like Jesus' ministry was then uh, six years long, or, or that you could even say that he, it was six years long, but that it, it stopped in his seventh year. That it was just a little over six years. So in his seventh year, Jesus was crucified. And this comes from understanding Daniel's prophecy of 70 weeks or 490 years. The decree of Artaxerxes in 458 BC to 33 AD is exactly 490 years. And Jesus' start of his ministry in 27 AD would have been after... 26 AD would, would have been the, when Jesus was beginning to be announced, and it, he started his ministry, and he started after he was, he was cut off and sent off into the wilderness, which is a kind of, the, there's a Hebrew word, he would, the Messiah would be cut off, but the cut off is carrot, and carrot can mean lots of different things, and I think Jesus actually fulfilled all of them. You can find that in my book. In chapter 5, when I talk about witnessing the end and I talk about the, these decrees, there's a lot of really interesting things. I don't have time to get into that now. But this, is, this whole full 70 weeks was fulfilled. The prophecy was not completed, but the first part of it was completed. And we can see that in the supports of the longer time for Jesus' ministry. So, But how can that be? Because many believe that, or were taught, that Jesus' ministry was only 70 weeks or three and a half years or somewhere in between there. And let's just say Christians have debated the length of Christ's ministry since the 2nd century AD and the early church father Irenaeus. So it just wasn't information that was directly revealed in Scripture or passed down from the apostles. So we just, we don't, we really don't know. Also, any argument that assumes that every Passover that Jesus celebrated during his ministry was recorded in the Scripture is just baseless. And you go, what? Like, no, we, we have to use the, the Passovers that are recorded in the Scripture. Yeah, but they weren't complete. 
And we know that because of John 20, 30, it says, Now Jesus performed many other miraculous signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not recorded in this book. And John 21, 25, And Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. And so what John is telling us is Jesus did a lot more than what we were able to write about, what we t- could take the time, what, the, what really the Holy Spirit led them to write about. And so we can't say we know every Passover that Jesus celebrated is in Scripture, because we actually have a counter-testimony to, to make us believe that that probably didn't include everything. And then this is kind of a fun one. So how old was Jesus when he died? So if he was born in late 5 B.C., or before April 3rd and, and 4 B.C., and he died in April 3rd, 33 A.D., he would have been 37. So, And then even if he was born after April 3rd, it still would have been his 37th year. And that makes more sense when we think about the Jews saying to Jesus, you're not yet 50 years old, they said to him. And you have seen Abraham? That's in John 8, 57. So, you know, we know Jesus was a little bit older rather than a little bit younger. You know, so closer to to 40 perhaps would have been been able they would have been able to say but you are not yet 50 if he'd been really close to 30 probably they wouldn't have said that and there's a kind of a neat thing about the number 37 and a bunch of the other numbers in scripture around this so if you want to see some some cool fun facts about numbers in the bible and and the, the potential significance of 37 you can here's a, a reference here to check out so the cross and the apocalypse, what does that have to do with anything? And so how are these things, though, tied? How is the, the apocalypse tied to the cross? Like, why does that? Why are those two things associated? And one of the reasons is because of Hosea 6.2, after two days he will revive us, on the third day he will restore us that we may live in his presence. So it seems like Hosea 6.2 is teaching that Jesus would return after 2,000 years, which Coincidentally, it's also near the end of 6,000 years, and if you've seen my, my other uh, videos about the Lord would return in this 6,000 years, so these, these kind of line up and say, oh, it should be near, but 2,000 years after what date? So most assume that after two days he will revive us, that must count after Jesus died and, and left, right? So they're, they're counting it after the crucifixion, but maybe that's not a good assumption. Let's look at Hosea 6, 1 to 2. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. So at the beginning of Jesus' ministry in 27 AD, he went to the synagogue and he read from the scroll of Isaiah. This is in Luke chapter 4. And he read from Isaiah 61, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So you see, Jesus you know, came to bind up the brokenhearted, and in Hosea 6.1, he will bind up our wounds, and after two days, he will revive us. So there's good reason to suspect that the count begins from the start of Jesus' ministry based on Hosea 6.1, rather than from the end of it. Okay, so... That, that seems to be the big, the big connection. But could it still be later than 2027? Yes, of course. Right? We are looking through a glass dimly. That's 1 Corinthians 13, 12. So only God really knows for sure. We're just given clues, and we have to seek and watch and pray. But that's the wrong question to be asking. Is there a reasonable possibility that this is right? That's the question you should be asking yourself. And here's another one. Am I ready? Right? Are you ready Look at what's going on. There's good reason to suspect that this could be right, and I think it's, that means we should be ready. So then here are the little trepidation. Can we safely talk about keeping the Sabbath? And, you know, I, I just I don't want to light people up over, over these issues, but at the same time, I think they need to be talked about. But I want to, you know, take into account Titus 3.9, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because they are unprofitable and useless. So I'm not doing this to, to be argumentative or to make some, because I have a bone to pick or I need to make some point. It's to talk about what does the Word really say and what have we learned in this, in this study about the Sabbath and about Sunday. And really the question, should Christians keep the Sabbath? So 
first, what is the Sabbath? The Sabbath is a day of rest and time dedicated to the Lord in its you know biggest picture sense. The Israelites were commanded to do no occupational work on the seventh day, and that's Leviticus 23.3, six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation, you shall do no work on it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. And in this case, work is like an occupational type of, you know, it's labor. And so there should be no debate, though, that human beings operate better when we get a day of rest every week. I mean, it's just, it's true, it's been proven scientifically, um, and or that God deserves, you know, that we have some time that we set aside for Him. That also shouldn't be debatable. Yes, God deserves that we set some time aside for Him. But we also have to remember that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. That's Matthew 12, 8. Also, we need to remember the priests in the temple were exempt from the Sabbath commandment so they could maintain the temple service. So Matthew 12, 5. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Why is that important? Because the elect of God have been made into priests. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Revelation 1, 5 to 6. He has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father. So, huh, that's interesting. We've been made priests, and Jesus talks about them being, you know, profaning the Sabbath and yet being blameless. Also, we know that emergencies or helping those in need was exempt. So Luke 14, 5, then he asked them, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And so, you know, we, we see that this isn't really constrained as tightly as, as sometimes the Pharisees try to make it. Furthermore, we're under a new covenant. We worship in spirit and truth, and we're under a new covenant, which of necessity is a changing of the law and of the priesthood, based on Hebrews 7, 11 to 12. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there still a need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron? For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also." And so this is an important one. When we talk about, could the law have changed? That's, we've changed the priesthood? Yes, there is also a change of the law. And, you know, but we are led by the Spirit. You are not under the law. That's Galatians 5.18. And then John 4.23, Yet a time is coming, and has now come, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. And 2 Corinthians 3, 6, he has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't have to be holy, that we don't have to be righteous. It, it just means that we're under a new covenant and a new way, and there is grace, and there is you know, a different way of dealing with these things, and it's really of the heart, if you wanted to say it that way, not of just you know, of following the law. And then here's a, here's a zinger. Um, there's also a clue in the Passover. So the first Passover, the first month, was changed to the seventh month. And this, this may help explain the Saturday to Sunday move. So in the first Passover, God made Nisan the old seventh month to be the first, uh, and which made Tishri, the original first month, to become the seventh. And that's in Exodus 12.2. This month shall be the first month, the first month of your year. So it seems clear that God changed the year to begin in, in Nisan, but actually they kept it really in Tishri, and this is if you saw my teaching on the two calendars, they actually kept both calendars. But look at this, when in the old calendar, Tishri was the first month, Nisan was the seventh. And then there's the 12 months of the Hebrew calendar. But once it moved Nisan to be the first, that made Tishri the seventh. Like, wow. So the first month really became the seventh month. That's just, you know, amazing. And then the last Passover, which Jesus fulfilled the last Passover, the first Passover was done with Moses. The last Passover was Jesus on the cross. And at that time, the first day became the seventh. And so, you know, about 1,400 years later, on the last uh, Passover, God raised up Jesus Christ on a Sunday and made the first day of the week, our Sabbath and day of worship. 
i.e. our seventh day. You know, that that's going to set some people off, but the essence of the Sabbath changed for believers in Christ, and it moved from Saturday to Sunday. It's true, early Jewish believers continued to meet on both Saturday and Sunday in order to share the gospel with other Jews, but the church was established on Sunday. That was even, again, as we, we talked about, Pentecost is always a Sunday. And lest we forget, we our works are finished, and we are in a state now of perpetual rest by grace. And that's Hebrews 4, 9-10. to There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. And this is, we are no longer saved by works, we're now saved by grace. We are in a rest. And again, look how Sunday, the first day of the week, then moves to the seventh, just like the first month moved to the seventh in the first Passover. I mean, it, there's an amazing parallelism here, and maybe this doesn't make sense. It makes a lot of sense to me. So, but whatever we, we come away with, one person regards one day above another, another regards every day alike, each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord. In all of this, let's remember that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. We are a kingdom of priests, and we have you know, come into a new covenant. And so let's think about grace. Let's think about um, understanding and patience with one another on this very difficult topic. And I just I hope that this was an encouragement and was not divisive, because that was not at all my, my intention with, with bringing these things up. I want to bring truth, and I want to bring stuff for people to consider so that we can have a much more open and broad and accepting view of the diversity that is there. There are lines that we don't, we don't cross. This isn't a time of apostasy. There is a division of, of the church in, in two camps at this point, but the, the camp that's holding the truth, the camp that is holding to God's Word and really looking for Christ, we need to really find ways to embrace and, and accept one another and, and be unified in that as we get ready for the bridegroom, because we want to heed the warning in Galatians 5.15. However, if you continually bite and devour one another, beware that you are not consumed by one another. And so that's that's my intention. You can find out more about me at endtimesbrian.com, and feel free to email me, christian at endtimesbrian.com. But thank you for watching. May we be found ready when he comes. Maranatha and, and amen.